I was looking for examples of uh, astrological references in Italian chronicles, and this one was an exceedingly juicy example. Um, the, it is a story of, uh, of an early Italian warlord, well, actually high medieval Italian warlord, and his fate, and it was chronicled by a number of different people. And in the book in which I was originally reading about it, uh, by a woman named Cerisi, or Cerisi, or Cerisi, I don't know how she pronounces the last name. Um, she described this. She described uh, uh, the chronicler as being very skeptical about astrology, and showed this as an example of how astrology didn't work. Okay, uh, being interested in astro astronomical chronology, I decided to reproduce the calculations and discovered that something else was going on. So, the question. I am raising is, did astrologers in the employ of an Italian tyrant attempt to bring about his death by means of choosing a very bad election for the beginning of a military campaign, which would signify his defeat, capture, and death? That is the question. The answer is yes. Here is our main protagonist, Ezzelino da Romano III, born April 25th, 1194 AD, died October 7th. 1259, and the dash one means this is the first slide about him. So, an Italian feudal lord in the March of Treviso, which is now Veneto, uh, somewhere in the northwest of Italy, who was a very close ally of the Emperor Frederick II, uh, and, he, uh, who, uh, and he ruled Verona, Vicenza, and Padua for almost two decades. Uh, he is often cited as one of the first examples of what in Italian is known as a condiatere, uh, which is Italian for conductor, uh, which doesn't sound very good with the English word conductor, but a conductor originally was someone who was under contract to do something. So we would say contractor. Condiatieri were originally hired to wage war on behalf of cities that did not put in the investment of were standing army. Uh, Ezzelino wasn't quite like the later type in that he actually was a nobleman, um, but he, even though his sociology is a little atypical of a condottiero, it's there are two forms, condottiere and condottiero, the plural is condottieri. Um, even though he doesn't have the normal sociology of one of these people, in that he was a member of the aristocracy, uh, he operated exactly in the same manner as the ones who came on later, uh, except that he did not work for other nobility. Well, he did initially, Frederick II, for example, but uh, for the most part he worked on his own, and for a period of time he controlled most of northern Italy. Uh, he was truly legendary for his cruelty. Uh, Wikipedia, in a in the manner of a uh, of many modern historians believe this was exaggerated by his many enemies and quite frankly after the events of the last few years I don't see how anybody could could believe that descriptions of hideous tyrants are exaggerated <laughs> because we've had too many recent examples Hitler Stalin and a whole lot of other people since believe it or not we have a chart he was born this is not a noon chart he was born at noon according to the Chronicle the Chronicle gives his complete birth data so here we have something truly remarkable. We have the real live birth chart uh, of a medieval person. The reason for this is mom was an astrologer, an amateur to be sure, but apparently quite a competent one. Um, so what do we have here? By the way, this is a whole sign house chart, so you read the signs as houses starting with Leo. And uh, we have a few little goodies here, like uh, Mars square Saturn. Uh, Mars in detriment, Saturn in dignity, which means the Saturn is very much in control. <clears throat> Venus in detriment, which means the, shall we say, emotional capacity of this person is a tad limited. Uh, we have a Moon-Uranus conjunction indicating a certain degree of emotional uh, craziness. Um, and if you want to be a little broad, you could argue we have a Mars-Saturn-Venus-Pluto T-square, which, given the way his life went, kind of makes sense. Um, Leo rising with the sun on the midheaven, which is uh, an unusually clear indication of a certain a person with a certain ambition to rule. Um, and Jupiter on the Jupiter in the tenth house by any standard, which would argue that this is a person who would probably be successful at it. Uh, so we might ask, what in this chart indicates that it would bring him to his end? 
Well, Jupiter, using the old rulers, is the ruler of the eighth house. And as we will discover in the final chart, Jupiter plays a very critical role, uh, oddly enough. Um, so uh, this is one of those cases where Jupiter's effect is not entirely, entirely benevolent. I mean, it wasn't entirely malevolent either. He did, after all, from having a few hereditary castles, uh, conquer most of northern Italy. That takes a certain amount of uh, good fortune, so to speak. Good fortune and absolute ruthlessness, some examples of which we will see shortly. OK, um, two major sources. Uh, Rolandino of Padua, Chronicle of the Trevisan March, uh, which was written around 1262 after the events in question. And uh, he is the main source of the material in this lecture. Uh, the anonymous monk of Padua, who wrote the Chronicon, I will pronounce this in the medieval, medieval manner, Marquie Terravicine et Lombardie, uh, and passages from Bonatti, who uh, was one of the people who worked for him. Not too happily, I might add. Uh, to demonstrate what I mean, here is Bonatti's comment on Ezzelina da Romano. That tyrant, Ezzelina da Romano, to whose tyranny there has been found nothing like, he spared no order, no religion, no nobleman, no one of any age, neither sex. He spared none of his own kin nor strangers. Rather, without cause, he killed with his own hands his own brother and his own nephew. And I myself have seen all of this. Uh, I'm not quite sure where Wikipedia comes off saying there's no real evidence he was really that bad, because this is an eyewitness. And then elsewhere in the uh, book on astronomy, he says, such a one was the tyrant Ezzelina da Romano, and also a certain astrologer of his named Salio. Now, this is a kind of interesting, but I'll finish reading this, and I'll explain what's interesting in the background. I believe that Salio agreed with Ezzelino rather out of fear, rather than because he believed it was true. I'll explain that. I believe this because Ezzelino was holding a brother of Salio's in leg shackles, concerning whom Salio was fearful that Ezzelino would have him killed. In other words, Salio didn't work for Ezzelino voluntarily. Ezzelino imprisoned his brother and forced him to work for him as a kind of extortion. If uh, this character at times seems to resemble the, uh, the more ruthless aspects of mafiosi, I would say yes, except the mafiosi are relatively mild-mannered by comparison. Um, the such a one reference is there was a discussion about the um, I believe the return of light, which uh, is an uh, Bonatti was debating the validity of the concept of the return of light, and he mentioned that Salio <coughs> did not believe in the return of light. Now, for those of you who have no idea what the return of light means, it's this: if a fast-moving planet applies to a slow-moving planet without any interference from any other planets. It's supposed to transfer its signification to the slow-moving planet. This is a doctrine, by the way, that is not present in modern astrology, and even most medieval astrologers haven't really learned to pay much attention to it, except to some degree in horrory. Um, so the slow-moving planet then takes over the signification, and then it applies to something else, or it's the final it receives the final disposition. This is a different notion of final dispositor than the modern one. Uh, it works by application rather than by rulership. Um, now, if, however, the slow-moving planet is combust or retrograde, uh, it can't take the disposition. It's too weak. And so it hands it back to the first planet, which then presumably goes on to apply to another planet, and it hands it to that one if that one is OK. If the fast-moving planet doesn't apply to anything in that sign, that can receive the disposition, then the whole matter goes, you know, fizzle. Um, and Ezzelino, uh, Ezzelino uh, did not believe in the return of light as a doctrine. And what Bonatti is saying here is that Salio agreed with him, probably not because he really thought that was true, but because he didn't want to disagree with the guy who had his brother in prison. Uh, and yes, the reputation of Ezzelino is such that a minor dispute on a doctrinal point of astrology could have easily gotten him angry enough to kill somebody. Nice man. <clears throat> I mentioned Ezzelino's mom, the Lady Adelaide. Um, but the Lady Adelaide, when she with great joy 
had seen for herself, that her husband was powerful, that her daughters were married in high estate, that her sons were flowing in wealth, lords of castles, powerful and retainers and clients, terrible to their enemies, and because she was learned in knowing the course of the stars, as she prophesied to her children, she died around the 50th year of her age. In other words, she forecast her own death, um, allegedly. Uh, and died quite happily because she had done what a good Italian mama is supposed to do, gotten her children well placed. Uh, Adelaide, it is also known, uh, taught Ezzelino something about astrology. And the result of this was that he fancied himself a highly qualified astrologer, which was um, somewhat short of the facts. Um, but. Um, he surrounded himself with astrologers. He had a veritable staff thereof. Um, let's back up here a moment. Uh, I'm going to read you something from a paper that isn't in the handout. Uh, let's hear. Um, let's see. Nope, I don't have it in the handout either. Not too terribly important. Okay. Now, Dad, Ezzelino II, said to. Uh, quoted a prophecy that his wife had made concerning her children. And he, this is the advice he was giving to his two sons, one of whom was Ezzelino, the second, third rather. He said, see now that the power of our house is not yet comparable to the commune of Padua. In other words, Padua has more beans than we do. But nevertheless, in truth, nothing as yet prohibits the common people of the Paduans, not even the entire people of the March, with God's help from submitting to the dominion of one of you, or perhaps both. For I recall that your mother, who knew about the courses of the stars, was knowledgeable about the celestial houses, and also knew the judgments of the stars, said this to me, she said, Behold, the fates prepare to unfold that which will cause weeping. Axanum will have seen that the powerful brothers destroy the Marquis's people. The Catholic Zanoni will conclude it. In other words, she described more or less what they were going to succeed in conquering. And, and his advice was, when the time is ready, go out and do it. Okay. Uh, as I said, Ezzelino was deeply into the art of using astrology to manipulate his destiny. Uh, sometimes I would have to say either Rolandino was reporting incorrectly or Ezzelino did things that were so magical as opposed to astrological that they were doomed from the get-go. And this appears to be one of those. Uh, at this point he was working for Frederick II. Uh, Ezzelino was at this point one of the noblemen working for the emperor. By the way, the emperor Frederick II, who was the last of the Hohenstaufen emperors, was uh, deeply into astrology himself. He employed uh, Michael Scott, who wrote several books on astrology and other aspects of medieval uh, lore, and he also employed Bonatti. Uh, Bonatti mentions uh, warning Frederick II in a solar return reading that a uh, conspiracy was going to be waged which would unfold on a certain date and according to Bonatti who cannot be described as a completely unbiased source here um, the conspiracy unfolded exactly as forecast but because Frederick was forewarned he was able to capture the conspirators and the conspiracy was foiled and there again uh, we had an esoteric point of astrological doctrine in reference to that okay so he is um, Laying siege to, I believe, the city of Parma. Let me just go to the next screen. Yeah, Parma. Okay. Um, so what he decided to do was to create a kind of metaphorical horoscope. So he created, presumably, to the east of the city of Parma. It doesn't say that, but it would have to be to make any sense. Uh, he constructed another city, which he called Vittoria, which means victory, of course. Um, and he went through the ancient Roman ritual that was used to found a city, which was you take a, a ditch with a plow that goes completely around the area that the city will be built in. And uh, uh, Roma, Rolandino quotes a bogus etymology of the word urbs, which means city in Latin, um, which has a distant connection with the word for ditch but that's probably an uh, etymological accident, but at any rate, he sees it as meaningful. And so what you do is you erect a chart for the moment that you make this ditch. 
uh, not obviously a technique that we would use now. Now it would probably be a cornerstone or something like that. So he began to define his new city with a sign of Aries rising, because Aries is the sign of Mars, the god of war. And Aries, of course, is the first house then, which has Libra setting in the west, a sign of Venus. Now, obviously, if you're going to go to war, Mars is going to trump Venus, according to standard astrological doctrine, although there is considerable lore that the Babylonian Ishtar had a warrior aspect as well. At any rate, this latter planet is said to be Venus, is said to be Parma's ruling planet and its fortune. It was almost as if by this means he thought that the fortune of Parma, which was opposed to him, so he built his city directly opposite Parma, would tend toward its setting, because Libra was setting in the west, ruled by Venus. You see how he's attempting to reproduce on the battlefield the chart of his election. In astrological matters and in those subjects which copy the subtlety of astrology, the first sign is given to the one doing an operation and the seventh to the adversary. That is absolutely sound electional and interrogational, i.e. horary astrology. Uh, the first house represents the attacker, the second house represents the opposition. Um, the person who first uh, makes the advance is the first house. And then he goes on, but I think he did not notice that the fourth sign from the ascendant was cancer, for the fourth sign designates building houses and cities. And so, a city founded under such an ascendant would rot like a canker. Now, what you may not know is the word canker is, or pronounced with a broad A, conquer, is the Latin pronunciation of cancer. Um, canker is the same word as cancer. It means crab. Um, so, but here, Rolandino's astrology is not sound. Uh, he's just making a bad pun. It's a pun that works in Italian and Latin, but not too well in English. But you can see the similarity. OK. Uh, OK, so that was an example of Ezzelina the Romano attempting to reproduce on the battlefield a situation that resembled an electional chart. Uh, I might add, by the way, it failed. And the reason it failed is electional astrology has one supreme requirement. You must do something real. And plowing a ditch and calling the city inside victory is not doing something real. Now, if he'd taken the trouble to actually build a city and have it functioning, maybe. But he didn't. It was, a, it was way too symbolic an act. It is the kind of thing, however, you would expect for somebody who was steeped in the, in the electional astrology of magic. And that may be very well where he was coming from. I still think, however, that if he ignored the position of the moon, which ruled the fourth, um, then the chart, that's where you would have seen that the chart wouldn't work. And we have no information on that score. This is the next slide. I'm not quite ready for it yet. So, oh, uh, Ezzelino accumulated a collection of astrologers. One of them was Salio that I mentioned before, uh, who is not known particularly well in modern astrology, but he actually translated one of the pseudo-hermetic works on the fixed stars into Latin, and that work is around. In fact, uh, I have um, several editions of it. Um, if you've ever seen a reference to Babinian stars or something like that, that's, it comes from this work, among others. Uh, those are just big, bright stars. That's all it means. Um, there was a uh, couple of others, and some person, Paul the Saracen, we don't know really who he was, and, of course, Bonatti. Uh, I think there are four or five of them, typically. and. Uh, as we already know, the astrologers weren't entirely voluntary. So the astrologers really had a reason for wanting to do this guy in. So we are now coming to the event. Um, let me just check something here. I need the date. Yeah, okay, 1259. In 1259, um, Ezzelino, uh had his astro well first of all early in 1259 he had a dream which was really kind of grim and he asked his astrologers to interpret it now i don't know about you but as an astrologer i do not feel competent to read people's dreams and while it's probably more likely in the middle ages they would have uh needless to say they weren't going to give the guy bad news so they told him it meant victory blah 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 and etc so uh 
Ezzelino was having a great deal of trouble with the city of Padua. Uh, he conquered it several times, and the people kept rising up, and he kept doing terrible, brutal things to the city. And finally, he was poised to make one last campaign to conquer most of the remaining parts of northern Italy he didn't conquer. By this time, you should be aware that the church had declared a crusade against him, and the uh, and they had amassed a considerable army, and that's exactly who Ezzelino was about to confront. However, it was not at all clear that, Ez that Ezzelino was going to lose this battle. Not at all clear. Ezzelino was extremely skilled, uh, ruthless, had a very considerable army of his own, and was motivated by the ferocity of his own fanaticism. Uh, so it was not clear he was going to lose. So he asked the astrologers, and it's not clear whether Bonatti was one of these or not. We don't know. We know that he worked for him from time to time, but I, I don't know if he was actually present at this situation. I think he might have commented on it if he had been, because Bonatti re describes a number of instances where he was present at a battle, and, um, and if he didn't, other people describe instances where he's present at a battle. So. Um, he asked his astrologers to find a date to begin the movement of his army toward the final campaign. Now, if you have, if you have a single battle, you are going to elect the chart for the moment that the, your side advances toward the battle. Now, I don't know what happens if somebody elects another chart for the other side to advance, but whoever advances first gets the election. Um, I don't know who, how they decide that, but <laughs> who goes first, but uh, they certainly don't do a coin toss. Um, but in a case of a campaign, what you do is you erect a chart for the moment the army moves out and begins its march. So we asked the astrologers to pick a time to do this. And so, as, as, uh, Roma, as Rolandino says, so when the date and time had been chosen for his moving, according to the advice of his astrologers and wise men, with his own foresight also affirmed, that is to say, um, he agreed with their conclusions, which is too bad, near the end of the month of August, he moved his entire army and the people of Brescia and along with this nearly uncountable number of livery, he rode in magnificence toward the castle and walls of Orzo Nuovi, which is where the battle was held. Uh, but it's the movement that the chart is erected for. That's the key point, not the, not the beginning of the attack. Because this is supposed to be a campaign consisting of several battles. OK, here is Ezzelino's description of the chart. And it must be, this is what really struck my fancy, is he gave the positions of all the planets and the ascendant. Uh, not the degrees, but he gave the signs. And it must be noted that when Ezzelino moved his people from Brescia and rode to Orzo Nuovi, the ascendant at that time was the sign of Sagittarius. The sun was in Virgo, the moon in Scorpio, Saturn in Aquarius, and then we run into an ambiguity in the translation here. Jupiter, it looks like there's a weird word, retroguardus, which I'm reading as rear guard. Um, it isn't a corruption of retrograde because Jupiter wasn't retrograde. Um, and that would have been retrogradus, not retroguardus. Uh, of course, it's possible that some scribe somewhere converted the word. But I'm going with it. It actually meant something like rear guard. That, in other words, it was the last planet to rise. That's how I interpret this. So Jupiter was the uh, rear guard in Libra direct, and Mars was in Leo. Now, there's just one problem. Jupiter can't be the rear guard in Libra if the moon is in Scorpio. So that was my first clue that something was fishy here. So Jupiter, according to this data, is neither the rearmost planet to rise or retrograde. And then he says, and Mars was in Leo, and likewise direct, Venus in Cancer direct, Mercury in Leo direct, and the head and the tail of the dragon in fixed signs. For those of you that aren't familiar with classical terminology, head and tail of the dragon is the English translation of the Latin words for the north and south node. Caput draconis is the head of the dragon, and cauda draconis is the tail of the dragon. And they were at that date at 14 Taurus and 14 Scorpio. He didn't bother to mention, by the way, which fixed signs they were in. He just had them. Uh, that was my calculation. 
Okay, so here's the chart. Uh, now, uh, I'm really forced to use whole sign houses here, even though at this point in time, they probably would not have used whole sign houses. They probably would have used uh, what we now call alcabicious houses, uh, so-called because alcabicious describes the system. The earliest appearance of that system, however, is in a late classical uh, astrological work by Hretorius uh, of Egypt, who describes the system in considerable detail. So it should be called, for future reference, although I doubt I'll have any impact on this, the Rhetorian house system. That's Rhetorian as in rhetoric, same spelling. So the ascendant is, so this is a whole sign house chart. Um, the ascendant is Sagittarius. There's the moon in Scorpio along with the south node. Uh, not the jolliest of symbolisms, but Jupiter in Libra, uh, which is pretty good, by the way, because you have Jupiter ruling the Ascendant in the 11th house, which is a benevolent house. And we have the Sun in Virgo in the 10th, or at least 10th sign. We have Mercury, Mars together. How close? I have no idea based on, on Roland Dino's statement, but we'll see shortly. The answer is not very. <clears throat> uh, Mercury, Mars in Leo, Venus in Cancer and uh, the North Node in Taurus. That's Rolandino's chart. OK, now uh, a little side trip here. Uh, my apologies for the slightly small print. It'd be, this would be a lousy projection display, but you can probably see it perfectly well on this display. We know from Rolandino that this happened in late August of 1259. By the way, for those of you who aren't aware of it, uh, solar fire is very good at finding dates of charts where you don't know the date, where you just have the positions. Uh, Rolandino does not give the day of the month, but this can be determined from astronomical positions. The best match for the positions is indeed for late August. Using the moon as a reference point, it entered the sign Scorpio on August 23rd, 1259 old style at 10.55 p.m. local mean time, which is not the kind of time they would have used, but I'm trying to get a reference point for our calculations, not for theirs. Uh, Meridian of Brescia. Uh, the moon entered the sign Sagittarius on August 26th, old style, so that was the end. It went, so August 23rd to August 26th, the moon was in Scorpio. This is the only period of time in August that the moon was in Scorpio. So that pretty well pins the time down. It's, the, it's somewhere between August 23rd and August 26th. Therefore, unless the date we have is completely wrong, we have to assume the date of Vesalino's chart is in between these two dates and times. Furthermore, we have the fact that the sign rising was supposed to be Sagittarius. Sagittarius began to rise at Brescia at about 12.42 p.m. local mean time on August 24th, and then again the next day at 12.38 p.m. on August 25th. And similarly, Capricorn began to rise at 3.07 p.m. on August 24th and 3.03 p.m. on August 25th. So our chart must be computed for somewhere, sometime on August 24th within one of these two time spans. Uh, we can't tell from Rolandino. However, a clue is the reference to Jupiter retrograd retrogradus. Um, and that's the reason why I favor August 24th. And Having no better information, I simply calculated the ascendant for 15 degrees Sagittarius in the middle. However, I have reason to believe it was probably earlier in Sagittarius than that. OK. That's, so here's the chart that results. This is the actual uh, uh, within an hour or so. Uh, so my, my suspicion is it was early Sagittarius rising. And the reason I believe so is I suspect that that Moon-Jupiter conjunction was in the Alcabicious 12th. Um, however, it's in the whole sign 12th in any case, which is the one I would have used. Um, but there, there it is, the Moon conjunct Jupiter in the 12th. Now, let's back up for a moment here. Not Jupiter in Libra. Jupiter in Scorpio. And this is a very important fact, because Jupiter is the ruler of the Ascendant. Are you with me, folks? OK, and the moon is in Scorpio, which is its fall. It's not exactly dignified. And oh, by the way, the moon is in the Via Combusta, which in those days actually was somewhere between 15 Libra and 15 Scorpio. Um, uh, nowadays, it's probably more like Sagittarius. But then that would have been in the Via Combusta, either sidereally or tropically. And I believe the Via Combusta, frankly, is supposed to be sidereal. 
because it's based on actual fixed stars. Okay, Mercury in Libra. Remember it was supposed to be in Leo? It's in Libra. Sun in Virgo, Sun in Virgo. Venus in Cancer, Venus in Cancer. Mars is supposed to be in Leo, Mars is indeed in Leo. Okay, so the calculations weren't all wrong. Now, here's the OAS oh, yes, in Saturn. Oh, yeah, Saturn. Yes, let's not forget Saturn. Saturn is supposed to be in Aquarius. Saturn is in Pisces. Um, something is clearly wrong here. Now, uh, an article that needs to be written at some point is an article on the accuracy of medieval astrological calculations. However, if you take Bonatti's charts and calculate them with modern astrological calculation routines, you'll discover he's consistently within two degrees, usually well within one. Here we have Mercury in the wrong sign, Saturn in the wrong sign, and Jupiter in the wrong sign. And Mercury is frequently screwed up because uh, you can all you have to do is to add the elongation in the wrong direction. That happens a lot. And you see that Mercury here is about what are them, uh, 35, 25 degrees to the east of the sun. If you go 25 degrees to the west of the sun, it will wind up in Leo, just as uh, Roland Dino said. That could have been a mistake. That could have been an honest mistake. Uh, the moon, everybody agrees, was in Scorpio. But it's hard to get Jupiter and Saturn wrong because all you have to do is look because they move so slowly. And this would tell me immediately that whatever, uh, if, if uh, Ezzelino actually saw this chart, it is clear he was not skilled in looking at planetary positions in the heavens. Okay, look at this chart for a moment and just think about it. And uh, let's move on. I have here a comparison between the two. Here you see the whole thing. Rolandino says the moon's in Scorpio, the moon's in Scorpio. Mercury's in Leo, Mercury's in Libra. Well, that could possibly be adding the elongation of Mercury from the sun in the wrong direction. I have a chart from the 16th century where the same thing happened, lovingly reproduced by several different authors. Um, Venus in Cancer, Venus is in Cancer. Sun in Virgo, Sun is in Virgo. Mars in Leo, Mars is in Leo. Jupiter is in Libra, Jupiter is in Scorpio. Saturn is in Aquarius, 18, uh, and uh, Saturn is really supposed to be in Pisces, and it's retrograde. So uh, this chart is quite substantially wrong, and wrong in a number of serious particulars. Let me just see what the next one is. Okay, yeah. So here's what Roland Dino has to say. I don't know if we're going to need a whole hour and a half for this talk, by the way, but uh, we can have plenty of time for questions and discussion. Roland Dino's commentary on the chart, which remember is whoops, the chart based on the left-hand column, not the chart based on the right-hand column. Uh, we have here some fairly specious astrological reasoning. Um, and actually, I've left out some of the more specious astrological <laughs> reasoning. A Rolandino was clearly not a practicing astrologer. I think he had a literate layman's knowledge of the subject, period. Um, he, Ezzelino that is, desired, I think, to believe that because Sagittarius is the house of Jupiter, and that planet is benevolent, for it is also called a fortune, it ought to be, for, it ought to be a fortunate and prosperous journey that was begun under such an ascendant. That's perfectly sound logic assuming that Jupiter is in a good place, which, remember, in Rolandino's chart, it is. It's in the 11th house. I suspect also that he knew then that Mars was in Leo, for Mars is called by the poets the god of war, and the sign of Leo is said to be a sign of strength and dominion, of high social status and of magnificent power. Um, that's perfectly sound. <clears throat> now we go, here's where things begin to go off the rails. Perhaps he also saw that Jupiter at that time was placed in Libra, which is the domicile of Venus, which is said to be a beneficial sign. Well, it isn't. It was in Scorpio. I also think that he placed the sign in a house of Mercury, namely the sign of Gemini, as the seventh, and the setting sign, wishing that the wisdom of his enemies would be, as it were, a setting. That's specious. Now, here is where the, here is where the chart is sound. Uh, according to Bonatti and a whole lot of other Arabic astrologers, um, 
it is better to, if you are the attacker or the initiator of an action against someone, it is better to have Mars, Jupiter, or Saturn ruling the first than having, uh, uh, having Mercury, Venus, or the Moon. Uh, and for that matter, it's better to ha not to have the sun rising either because that means Saturn is setting. The point is superior planets, all things being equal as rulers, trump inferior planets. The inferior planets technically are Venus, Mercury, and the moon. The sun is the boundary line. It's neither inferior nor superior. Although with respect to Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, it's inferior. Um, that means lower, closer to the Earth. That's all that means. It doesn't mean inf it, it doesn't, for the most part, have anything to do with the superiority or inferiority of the planet as an energy, except that the superior planets have greater staying power because they move more slowly. Okay, so um, while Roland Dino's argument here about Sag rising and Mercury setting is bogus from a symbolic point of view, it would indeed have been advantageous to make a superior planet the ruler of the Ascendant, assuming the superior planet were not in poor shape. Okay, for Mercury is considered the god of wisdom, and the seventh house, whether among astrologers or geomancy, is always assigned to the adversary. So that doctrine is correct. Uh, Mercury, by the way, for those of you who may not be aware of it, is the traditional ruler of astrology, because it is, uh, first of all, a science, and secondly, Mercury rules all forms of divination. So, um, okay, so he's giving what he thinks is the reason why Rolandino chose this chart. Now he has to explain why it failed. Yet, it is a wonder that he did not realize that the moon was in Scorpio at the time, because the moon, the lowest of the planets, among all of the planets, has the most influence and power on this lower world. And since the scorpion is a poisonous enemy, animal, and the poison is poured out in the tail, this almost seems to portend that the journey, signified by the planet of the journey, uh, the moon, by the way, is, uh, does, uh, is supposed to be well placed at the beginning of a journey. That's clear. That is, the, that is the moon, which possesses the feet in a human being. He could be wounded, as it were, by the poison of a scorpio toward the end. Now... I'll comment here on this, the moon possessing the feet in the human being. There is no lore that I know of that says the moon inherently rules the feet. It inherently rules the breast. However, 12th house planets, the 12th house affects the feet. Um, in modern astrology, there is a common tendency to treat the signs and houses as the same. Aries is like the first house, Taurus is like the second house, and so forth. In traditional astrology, this is almost never done except in one area. and That one area is in parts of the body. So the ascendant and the first house rule the head. The second house and Taurus rule the uh, neck. The uh, third house and Gemini I rule the arms and shoulders, etc. So uh, as far as the body signification of a house is concerned, it rules the same part of the body that the corresponding sign rules. So anything in, pi anything in the twelfth house affects the feet. Uh, many years ago I realized my tendency to have foot problems was signified by the fact that I have Saturn retrograde in the twelfth opposing the sun. Um, and my foot problems are arthritic in nature, so that fit rather well. Um, this Assignment of houses to parts of the body is, in fact, very good. It works quite well. Although we'll discover shortly there's another way of assigning planets to body parts as well, which is uh, not to be used instead of, it's to be used complementarily. So, at any rate, the moon is in the 12th house, which is possibly suggestive that something might happen to the feet of someone. And then he goes on, as it could also be proved by, believed by analogy, someone trusting the sign of Sagittarius rising, both if he is born under it or begins a journey or, or other work of his under it, he might be believed to have something to do with an arrow. Um, yes, but not to be hit by one. The more likely he'd shoot one. This is, this is where the astrological reasoning gets specious. But it's the sort of thing a medieval pop astrologer might do. Uh, and there were such things. I mean, the literacy of lay people knowledgeable lay people in astrology was actually very high, um, much higher than it is now. I would say the, your average medieval intellectual, and Rolandino as a, as a literate monk would qualify, uh, 
was familiar with the basics and could spin a yarn about astrological symbolism. Uh, the analogy I like to use is, uh, for those of you that know anything about uh, uh, cultured life in the 1920s and 30s, everybody who was anybody was conversant in basic Freudian uh, language and, and Freud speak would buzz all over the cocktail hour. Well, in a similar way, astro speak would too. Uh, in the Middle Ages, except that, of course, um, the actual art of astrology as practiced by the professionals like Bonatti was way beyond what happened in the uh, medieval analog of a cocktail hour. Uh, there was exactly there was actually no medieval analog of the cocktail hour, but whenever people got together to talk, um, okay, so he got an arrow in his foot. Now this is really crummy astrological reasoning, the, because the feet comes from the moon in Scorpio, and the Sagittarius rising produces the arrow. And uh, that's like uh, it's common belief among many astrologers that uh, the weak point in a person's body is uh, connected to their sun sign. Well, actually, that should be the strong point. Uh, the weak point of a person's body is in the sign on the 6th and 12th. But at any rate, OK. Now, I'm going to switch here for a moment over to my um, I hope you can read that and go away, Adobe. Uh, this is a table from Scherner about how each part of the body, uh, each planet, rules a different part of the body in different signs. Now, I have to say this particular rendition isn't entirely systematic, but um, Bob, could you maybe zoom in a little bit on that? I, I, I will try another way here. Let's see. Uh, first of all, let's make this full screen here. And then, um, well, that'll do. I can just scroll. How's yeah, that? Yeah, that's much better. Okay. Thank you. OK. Um, I, by the way, I haven't sent you this. I have to send you this, too. Um, Saturn and Aries rules the breast. Why? Because Aries is the fourth sign from Capricorn, which Saturn rules. And the fourth, there, that, so by analogy, if you make Capricorn the first, the relative position of Aries is the fourth, the fourth rules the breast. In other words, it's counting house positions from one of the signs. And this is partly really where the whimsy comes in, which one do you use? And sometimes it's one, sometimes it's another. So this started out as a theoretically consistent doctrine. Um, Jupiter rules the belly. Well, the belly is the fifth sign. Aries is the fifth sign from Sagittarius. You could also argue it also ru should rule the throat because it's the second sign from Pisces. Um, I have no explanation for that. So at any rate, this table has in its origins a rational foundation. Um, Sun and Aries rules the thighs because Aries is the ninth sign, which is analogous to Sagittarius, from Leo. See how it works? OK, if we go down to Scorpio, we find that Jupiter in Scorpio, remember Jupiter is the second column here where the little hand is, uh, rules the feet. OK? So going back to the slideshow, no, 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 not that. I'll away with you. OK. Uh, no, I don't want to go to webinar. Maybe I do. Yes, I. No, here's what I want. OK. OK, so firing up the slideshow again. Here is Bonatti on the same subject. And as you can see, he completely agrees with the, with the table we just saw. I think Bonatti's is a little more rational. Scherner's is a later one when they were beginning to lose track of the logic. In, in Scorpio, Saturn indicates the ankles of the feet. Why? Because Scorpio is the 11th sign from Capricorn and the ankles are the 11th house and the 11th sign. Jupiter, the feet themselves. Then he goes on to add, the 12th two signifies prisons, because it signifies the place of imprisonment and the prisoner himself who has already been imprisoned. It also, in actuality, the 12th house is given to the incarcerated, because the house falls away from the line of the eastern horizon. Now, I didn't put it in here, but it is also, uh, Bonatti actually assigns the three houses, 4, 8, and 12, which if you want to use the element analogy, which I prefer not to, but it's clear, the water triplicity of houses, um, 
all of them rule different aspects of imprisonment. And um, to my surprise and amazement, that actually does seem to work. But the twelfth is the primary one. Um, so whenever you see heavy twelfth house activity, you can uh, that is always a risk if the person puts themselves into a position to be okay. Then Bonatti adds. This is, by the way, Bonatti is not talking about this chart. This is just delineations taken out of his book. So, so there are 17 modes by which impediments and detrimental things happen in all matters which suffer impediment. I love the way they phrase things. In all beginnings, interrogations, in all journeys, in all nativities, in everything which we wish or intend, that's supposed to be intend, sorry, to do. The ninth of these is that the moon is located from the 15th degree of Libra up to the end of 15 degrees of Scorpio. These 30 degrees are the Via Combusta. And like I said, um, even though the Via Combusta is probably subject to precession, back that far, that position of the moon would have been in the Via Combusta because it was near the end tropically, um, which means it was further backwards sidereally. Uh, it would have definitely been in that space range. So. We have a number of rather gooey indications here. OK, let's go back and look at the chart. Here is the chart of the, uh, here is the chart of the campaign beginning. The real one. We have the moon in Scorpio, which arguably is somewhat toxic, uh, applying to a conjunction of Jupiter in the 12th. Jupiter is the ruler of the ascendant. Now the ascendant is the person taking the action. Therefore, we have reason to believe that it is possible for that Jupiter to indicate that the initiator of the action winds up in prison. Now, in addition, we have Saturn in Pisces, which it's not supposed to be in the original chart. Saturn in Pisces in the fourth house. Now, of course, that's the fourth whole sign house. So here I'm taking advantage of a technique they wouldn't have actually used. Uh, from the point of view of uh, medieval astrology, the ruler of the fourth would have been Mars ruling Aries. Uh, but Mars is square. Mars is square Jupiter. Uh, that's a square with reception, but it's still square Jupiter. Um, so you could actually get it either way with whole sign houses or with alcabicious houses. That um, the uh, there is something funny going on with that Jupiter. It's not an entirely happy Jupiter. Um, OK, uh, the Mercury I would not describe as much of a player here. But now let's ask the question, what house does the moon rule? And the answer is the eighth, by any standard. Alcabicious, whole sign, you name it, the moon rules the eighth. So what we've got here is an election chosen with the moon, the ruling of the house of death, applying to a conjunction of the ruler of the house of the initiator in the house of imprisonment. And remember, by the way, the eighth is also a house of imprisonment, along with the fourth and the twelfth. So this chart having the potentiality, in terms of medieval astrology, mind you, I'm not talking about how I would necessarily read this chart. In terms of medieval astrology, if the astrologers actually had all of this chart, minus Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and Chiron, of course, um, they, would have, they would have decided it was not a particularly benevolent chart, especially because the moon is extraordinarily important in initiating journeys. Um, so to have the ruler of the eighth house, the planet of journeys, is kind of crummy. Um, Jupiter in Scorpio is not so terribly debilitated, but it's not exactly dignified either. Um, but it is the ruler of the Ascendant, and it's in its own 12th house, which means that it has to do with the feet. So here's what happened. Etzelino, at the height of the battle, was shot in, an, shot in the foot by an arrow, taken prisoner, and allowed mysteriously to die in prison. And that was the end of his reign. And I believe this chart shows precisely, in, again, according to medieval methods, shows precisely this result. Either, there are only two scenarios that can explain this. Either Ezzelino da Romano was extremely unlucky in his choice of astrologers, who didn't know what they were doing and simply gave him the wrong information, or his astrologers knew precisely what they were doing, and they were getting rid of them. 
That's why I call this whole thing assassination by electional astrology. Now, ultimately, we don't know. Oops, let me get back to my last. We don't, really don't know. But again, we do know that the astrologers of the period were perfectly capable of erecting charts that were good enough to be readable. Uh, they would make mistakes, certainly, but not three out of seven planets in the wrong place. That's just too bad, especially two of them being Jupiter and Saturn. And if there's one thing you do have to know as an astrologer, it's what sign Jupiter and Saturn are in, because they, Saturn spends two and a half years in a sign, and Jupiter spends one year in a sign. And the only thing I can assume is that Roland Dino had absolutely no idea where the planets really were, not Roland Dino, Etzelino, excuse me, got my Enos mixed up here. Etzelino uh, had no idea where the planets were, and so the astrologers gave him a plausible fiction. And his son had to be right, because that correlates with the date. Um, the moon in the 12th was a bad idea by any standard. Um, how they convinced him that that was okay, I don't know. Um, now, normally you'd say, well, gee, a Moon-Jupiter conjunction, that's not so terrible. No, it isn't normally. It's just um, medieval astrology is very, very heavy on the idea of what was later called local determination as being what a planet meant. Local determination means that the planet's signification has more to do with the house it rules than with its natural signification uh, as a planet. And as we may recall here, backing up way, 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 Whoops. Uh, Etzelino had Jupiter very high up in his chart in Taurus ruling his eighth house. So to make Jupiter with this birth chart conjunct uh, in the twelfth house of an election ruling the ascendant was this this I don't think the astrologers necessarily knew. It would, be, it would be assuming a little bit too much guile on their part to know they had his birth chart, and that for him, Jupiter was an accidental malefic by virtue of its ruling the eighth house. Uh, but it was, in fact, an accidental malefic. Um, now, this is not the way I would read this for a modern person. Let me just make this startlingly clear. Um, uh, but I would say that if Jupiter were in this position and the eighth house, and it ruled the eighth house, then this person's career ought to have something to do with the eighth house. Um, like you know, being a banker or a mortician or dealing with other people's money or or even a psychotherapist because they do heavy transformation. Well, in a way, Atzelino's career did have something to do with the eighth house. He killed people on a grand scale, uh, but that's not exactly what you call a positive manifestation of Jupiter. Okay, let me exit the slideshow and go directly to the last one. Um, that's why I don't have to. Uh, Okay. Um, just this is just so you have it. It's my contact information, and uh, that's the end of the formal lecture. So we can use as much of the, as much of the remaining time as we want for questions and discussion. Okay. Well, I have one right off the bat. Okay. And that's with you. Just commented you don't think they would have had Etzelino's birth chart. Is that? I mean, he had his chart, and. Yes. So you think what well, actually they might have because now that I mentioned now that you mention it, his birth date is given in Rolandino's uh, chronicle, so it's quite clear that it was known. Yeah, so that may very well have uh damn it, I don't want to trying to get the, bend this thing to my will. I maybe if I just Yeah, there we go, okay. Yeah. Um so yeah, it's quite possible that they did have it, in which case they knew what they were doing, really knew what they were doing. Well, that does bring up another question: Is if the in the time period the people in power very often had astrologers? Did they try and keep their birth data quiet so that sort of like in Rome, so that people wouldn't be trying to find the best times to do them ill? Well, presumably they wouldn't keep them quiet from their own astrologers because the own astrologers couldn't uh, operate very well for them if they knew them. So I I, I think your point is well taken. Um, they must have had his birth chart. Because it was known. The time when they when they wouldn't have is if they, nobody knew what the chart was. But in his case, it does appear to have been known. Um, 
However, the usual way that patrons employed astrologers was by bestowing a great deal of wealth on them and making it not in their interest to do bad work. Ezzelino's tragic flaw was um, uh, using extortion to get his astrologers to work for him. Because, you know, basically his default option was cruelty. I mean, he may have rewarded them well, I don't know. All I know is that, according to Bonatti and others, his astrologers were in fear of him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you really don't want to have your astrologer in fear of you. This is uh, uh, a bad thing to do. Now, the, from, from an academic point of view, uh, it, if I were giving this as a paper in an academic conference, my point would be not that astrology works, but that, uh, although I happen to believe it does, obviously, uh, but that the way a medieval would have read this text would have led to that conclusion. And that's why I cited those passages from Bonatti, because Bonatti was one of the people. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I can't believe that chart was an accident. Here's another question. Uh, did, have you looked at the fixed stars, or did they use the fixed stars in there? Yes, they did. I haven't, but they did, yes. Because um, uh, yeah, one they, person they, is commenting Jupiter was conjunct Caput Ogle, but I don't know if that's in the birth chart or in the election chart. Uh, it would be Maybe the they'll... birth chart. It was in Taurus. But that, are, uh, have we corrected Caput Algol for precession? That's the good question. <laughs> uh, I can answer that uh, if you'll bear with me for a moment having as I do the chart. Okay, here's this chart, and what we're going to do is to open up the display. See, it's the same chart. And now we're going to get a report on the fixed stars. So let's take a look. Current chart. Um, oh, wait, okay, that's not how I do this. I do it over here, reports. Now these will be corrected for precession star aspects. Okay, so um, unfortunately this is filed by planetary bodies rather than, okay, so let's Jupiter. Uh, no, uh, actually it's uh, Jupiter is in the Hyades, which is um, probably no improvement over Algol. Of course, I don't know if this planet will even tell us about Algol, come to think of this program, because it's doing ecliptic ray stars only, or ones that are reasonably close. But Jupiter would have been physically in the face of the bowl uh, near the beginning, the first one, which is uh, generally considered to be a fairly difficult place. So that would not have helped. Uh, if I go to Perons, I may be able to get the information on uh, Jupiter um, actually being with Algol. Uh, this is supposed to be done in the manner of Bernadette Brady, and she's informed me that, it, no, it is not. <laughs> <laughs> she would never have had it done this way. Um, I think it was their loose interpretation of what she does. Okay, there is no respect in which Jupiter has any relation to Algol. Algol, remember, this is, this is uh, um, 700 years ago. That's a lot right. of recession, about 10 degrees worth, actually. So that's in the natal chart, so the question would then be, I guess, is whether that was connected at all in the electional chart. Or no, do they did they use fixed stars in the election? Um, yes and no. Um, they actually had a very clear doctrine about that. Uh, fixed stars were to be used in the election of a city or a building that was supposed to last a long time, because the fixed stars are related to things that have long lifespans. It was not supposed to be used typically in elections for personal events, because the energies were too intense and unpredictable. Okay. Uh, that's stated by a number of uh, Arabic and Latin astrologers, that doctrine. Uh -huh. And it's actually derived from Ptolemy, one of Ptolemy's, so-called so Ptolemy, it's pseudo-Ptolemy's syntiloquy. It's uh, where he talks about using the fixed stars in the charts of cities and, and long live buildings. So you had the one quote from Bonatti on Ezzelino um, early on. Did yep. did Bonatti write anything else, or was that just basically sort of a in passing? Um, at no point does he give a systematic biography of Ezzelino, but it refers to him three or four times in the course of the book, and usually in somewhat derogatory terms. <laughs> so when you have... You know, as you said, they, they tended to give lots of money to their astrologers so that they could keep them 
<laughs> working for them and not for somebody working against them. Uh, did mm -hmm. they did they formalize that at all? Did were there like medieval contracts that occurred? Oh with... uh, no! Uh, basically, I think there were the astrologers' connection with the Lord was basically the same, like a retainers. You know, so, he became he paid homage to the Lord, which okay. is a formal way of affiliating. Uh, contracts were you, oh, contracts did exist, but they existed on, almost entirely in middle class um, in middle class operations. Uh, what people have to understand is that modern civilization uh, in, the, in the Middle Ages there were basically four classes of people. There was the church, uh, the nobility, what we now would call the middle class, and the peasantry. Um, the peasantry still exists. I don't mean that in a derogatory manner. There are countries we have large quantities of country people very close to the land. I would not include American farmers in the category peasantry. I would put them in the category of middle class. Um, and uh, the uh, the military is, of course, analogous to the nobility, except that the military isn't considered to be aristocracy. And modern modern society, at any rate, by and large, is completely middle class. Uh, almost all of the apparatus of middle class life did exist by this time in medieval Europe. It's just that the other classes have sort of withered away, except the peasantry to some extent. Okay. Oh, somebody and said I, they just checked the star parans. Um, Zosma was on the ascendant at birth. His. Uh, uh, yes, see. on Aslino's ascendant at birth. What is Zosma? I, I am not familiar That's with That's a star in Leo. Uh, okay. uh, I, what it means precisely, I don't know, but let's bring that. Let's uh, see what its reputation might be. Okay, uh, back to reports. Reports, current chart. Uh, now again, we want fixed star aspects. Star aspects, okay. Well, this one was on the Paran. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, that is possible. Okay, so that, uh, so we have to, where the hell the ascendant is located here. Um, I think it's at the end. This table really is kind of bizarre. Okay, yes, uh, oh, nature, so nature of Saturn, Saturn Venus, Venus, according to this. So, so it was. So the uh, the ascendant was at two hours thirty nine minutes and forty seconds of right ascension, and Zosma rose at two hours thirty seven minutes and twenty six seconds, which means it's well within a degree bodily of the horizon. Um, any star that rises in Paran with the ascendant means it's physically on the horizon. And uh, this person saying that Bernadette considers Zosma where Hercules broke the lion's back, a victim aspect. Uh, I'm, well, not I'm not qualified to comment on that, actually. Yeah. Well, look, um, he doesn't seem like much of a victim for most of his life. <laughs> no. He, he, uh, everybody, gets, you know, everybody gets to be a victim occasionally. In his case, it was the last act. But uh, yeah. <laughs> no, for the most part, I would say he was solidly a perp. Yes. <laughs> that maybe the other side of Hercules breaking the lion's back was much more appropriate as an yeah, image Hercules for him. Side. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Another question is, have you done the Fedaria for uh, Good point. Let's take a look. Uh, let's see. The date was, um, i got the slideshow back here. Okay. Whoops. Yes, that we want. Okay. Uh, we're talking about the natal chart, right? Yes, of course we are. Uh, okay, there's the natal chart. Oh, that was stupid of me. I had it right there. The, um, hello. Ah, <laughs> uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, Ferdaria. Just to prove that I do, in fact, look at these. There they are. By the way, if anybody wants to give me an argument about nocturnal charts, I'll be happy to take them on. I've written extensively about it in my doctoral dissertation. <laughs> um, I can cite you chapter and verse and page references to how the whole thing happened. Um, okay, but in any case, this is a diurnal birth, so who cares? Uh, so this, wait, what was it? Oh yeah, uh, this is birth chart was 1194, and the date was 1258. <laughs> That's the one I needed to look up. Was the oh the Date of the battle. Yeah, let me get that. Yes, in here too. twelve. The date of the. Let's see what open. Um. 
Yeah, Rolandino's election, 24. Oh, boy, which one is this? That's not the one. That's the one. Okay, now we've got, now we've got the election here. Okay, so it was, uh, yeah, August 12, 59. Okay, so back to here and, re and view Ferdaria, August 12, 59. Uh, would have been in a period of Mars and Venus. The whole thing is Mars. Um, and okay, let's so let's take a look at the birth chart. Mars is in Libra in fall, <laughs> opposite Venus in Aries in fall. Um, not the world's snazziest Venus-Mars opposition. They are arguably in mutual reception, but uh, the general lore is that when planets are in major debility, the mutual reception doesn't work. Um, and Saturn is squaring it from dignity. So um, uh, that, and Venus, by the way, is for the aficionati, is the, is the um, uh, exaltation ruler of the eighth. So both the benefics have rulership in the eighth. Um, <laughs> not what I'd call really great. Um, so uh, I would say I would have to say that a Venus Mars period with Theodara would not Theodaria would not have been good for this person. Yeah, that Venus Mars doesn't look like it's in very good shape at all. <laughs> no, in in uh, Alcabish's houses too would be second to eighth. Uh huh. So. That's uh, yeah, it's not great. And Saturn, by the way, is the ruler of the seventh, so that's the opponent. Mm -hmm. um, so at some point, he would run into a superior opponent, which he did. <laughs> oh, the, we've got another comment on the Zosma. It was culminated with the sun, and it seems like that would be showing him as likely to have victims as to ultimately be one, which in a way could corroborate the hypothesis that his astrologers yeah. deliberately did him in. <laughs> Yeah, I, oh, though, actually, remember, we have to use the delineations they would have used. True. Uh, Bernadette has uh, done a pretty spectacular job of reinterpretation of the fixed stars, and it, I'm not saying anything to detract from the merit of her interpretations, but that is not what they would have used. Okay. Because their interpretations were, uh, they probably would have talked about le leonine qualities, which is also appropriate. Okay. Uh, let's see, there is, um, oh, another question of how, uh, oh, do, 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 where does it go? How did the medieval astrologers learn their trade? Did, um, it depends. Uh, there probably were two routes. Uh, Bonatti, it is widely believed, although not proven conclusively, actually was a student and a professor at the University of Bologna in the medical faculty. Uh, it was taught, astrology was taught in the medical faculties in Paris and Bologna and Padua and a few other places. Um, after that, you would have been taught by a previous master. It would have been a master-apprentice relationship. And of course, uh, you would also read lots and lots of books, all in Latin, of course, because there was no vernacular, uh, there was no vernacular literature uh, in astrology at all, except, interestingly enough, Alcabicius was translated into English. Hmm. At the time of Chaucer, so it's it's translated into Middle English, uh, because Alcabicius was the single most popular astrology book in the middle in medieval Europe. Uh, that's why his house system became so dominant. Um, Bonatti, when Bonatti is talking natal astrology and basic astrology, he's almost pure Alcabicius. When he's talking about material he himself views, he's almost pure Bonatti. <laughs> That's the, that's the point of my dissertation. When an astrologer actually uses something, he changes it. Uh huh. Interesting. So you would have a definite distinction between, and I I would imagine then the ones that have a reputation and have the higher level of education would be the sought after astrologers by the political crowd. Yeah, by, uh, by your and rulers. it also has to it also has to be pointed out they were all well educated because you had to read Latin. Mm hmm. They, they, literacy in the Middle Ages meant able to read and write Latin. Well, and for so, the astrologers, able to also do some pretty sophisticated calculation. Yes, and uh, uh, I have looked a little bit at the tables that were used at the time, and they're not quite as grim as one might expect, but the, the casting a chart quickly was uh, not... I, I suspect what most, po most of them did was they probably calculated their own ephemerities, 
uh, for a year or so and then interpolated. But but they had they had to do their own. I don't necessarily know if they calculated every chart from the tables. They may have. This is not a subject where we know the answer particularly well, because the uh, ephemerides probably would not. They weren't published, so they wouldn't have survived. Mm -hmm. We don't have any published ephemerides until the invention of the printing press. Would you know you have in your chart, like especially for the one of the election, the part of fortune, was that something used? Would they yeah, have absolutely. paid attention? So oh, yeah. it is not in very good shape in that no, election. You're correct. It is not in good shape. Whoops. Nuts. Not what I wanted to do. Let's try that again. Yes, the part of fortune is at zero Pisces. Um, squaring Pluto. Uh, it's only problem is we don't really know which sign it's in. It was probably actually in late Aquarius. I'm right about early Sag rising, then the part of fortune would have been in Aquarius, ruled by Saturn, um, and quite possibly. Oh, this is the wrong. No, this is the wrong chart I have here. By the way, this is the one for 24 hours later. Let me get the right one. Oh, I just go back to my slideshow. That's better. There. Okay. It's August 24th, not 25th. The part okay. of yeah, part of fortune is at 16 Aquarius, and it would have probably been an Aquarius here. So the part of fortune is opposite Mars. Okay, that in itself is not necessarily a bad thing, because if you use the part of fortune, well, actually it is in a way. If you use the part of fortune as an alternative ascendant, which the medievals probably wouldn't have, um, then you have Mars on the seventh house. Um, but that seventh house is the enemy, so that would be bad. Uh, or the medievals would have looked at it as Mars opposing the part of fortune, which would be an affliction. So yeah, that part of fortune is kind of crummy here, especially given that it's in the house of journeys, one of the houses of journeys, and Mars is in the other one. And what about the, I mean, would they have counted the square to the Jupiter? Um, that would simply be considered a tenth house aspect. Okay. Okay. I don't think they would have regarded that as particularly malevolent. Would they have also included, what would they have thought about the south node being so close to the Jupiter? Uh, that would have sucked. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very bad indication. <laughs> yeah, that was a very bad indication. Okay, let's see. I've got to collect a number of different comments here, questions. Um, moon conjunct Jupiter in the campaign chart, where the moon mm -hmm. moves quickly to square the part of fortune, ruled by Saturn retrograde in foot-related Pisces. Would yeah, keep in mind that the part of fortune moves even faster than the moon does. Okay. Uh, so that would not necessarily be the case. Okay. The part of fortune holds its relationship to the ascendant except that as the moon advances beyond the sun, the part of fortune advances away from the ascendant. Okay. Um, how much astrology was it intertwined with magic during the early 12th uh, century, since you said that there seemed to be some potential magic going on by Aslino with his ditch? <laughs> uh, the answer to that is astrology was the main foundation of magic. If you read the Picatrix, which is now available completely translated. I don't know how good the translation is, but it is available. Um, you will discover that everything is astrological. Basically, it's the art of electing charts to cast spells. So if you can't get the chart you want, then you also use spells to help make it work? No, it's for no, taking it's... the time for doing the spell. Oh, I see, for doing the spell. Okay, exactly. oh, specifically, okay. Yeah. Did they, have, did they use remedial measures? Amulets and talismans, yes. Um, Bonatti actually refers, I, can't I haven't been able to find where he refers to it, but uh, uh, he, uh, a butcher came to him wanting to increase his trade, and Bonatti found an extremely rare combination of, uh, of energies coming together, and he made a talisman, and the guy quickly became extraordinarily wealthy. And uh, several years later, the man worrying that he'd done something diabolical, went to his priest, and his priest advised him to destroy the talisman, which he did, and immediately his wealth vanished. <laughs> um, 
and uh, he came to Bonatti asking him to make another one, and he said, fool, those combinations will not happen again for a thousand years. <laughs> so do you, did you find any evidence that Isolino also used those types of talismans or requested them from his astrologers? Uh, not directly, no. That would, you see, you would have had to know things about his intimate personal life and, uh, uh, rather than his public acts of atrocities and that we don't know. However, the thinking involved in that episode with the city of Vittoria opposite Parma suggests that he was thinking like a, ma a magical astrologer, just not a very competent one. But no, it, it, people like him would have certainly tried to employ magic. Successfully or not, I can't say, but they certainly would have tried. <laughs> but it, was there, it, in all your researches, was there any um, did you see anything between leaders or political leaders trying to deliberately do other leaders in via their astrologers or magic through this time period? Or was that yeah, another hey, one of those things that wouldn't really be <laughs> written oh, down? Uh, there are rumors out, of course, all over the place. There was a collection of, uh, of nobility in Ireland who tried to do in, do in the uh, the current ruler of England by magical means, which simply resulted in all of them being tried and condemned for witchcraft. Um, that sort of thing you have a fair amount, not I would say a lot of, but there's a fair amount of it. Um, the most common way of using astrology in uh, military craft was to begin wars under the right configurations. Okay. Was that fairly common? I wouldn't say it was universal, but Bonatti wasn't the only one. Okay. Uh, we actually have three people we know for sure did it, and the rest we just don't know anything about. Uh, Bonatti was one. Uh, there was an Italian Renaissance astrologer named Bonincontrio, uh, who talks about elections for military matters uh, and describes events that he had personally himself witnessed. Um, and then, of course, Lily. Uh, and Lily's, Lily's military astrology is really, really closely derived from Bonatti's. But Lily really did it. He didn't just quote other people. He really did it. Or, but he didn't do elections. He did horrors, interrogations. Um, we have an, uh, one of the things I mentioned in my dissertation is in the 19th century, Zadkiel I, Richard Morrison, or James Morrison rather, um, uh, describes a chart of the beginning of a siege in Belgium as an inceptional, which is basically an inadvertently chosen election, and shows how clearly it indicated that the French were going to win the siege. Mm -hmm. uh, and the rules he uses are exactly Bonatti's. I, I point that out to show that Bonatti's influence lasted all the way into the 19th century, and I didn't bother to point out that it's actually becoming stronger than ever now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, what they'll accept as a historical dissertation may not extend to modern. <laughs> yeah, there are limits of tolerance here, and I'm not trying to push them too far. <laughs> um, you know, there is another good question here, is when astrologers were proved wrong, and Rosalini was, um, re or yeah, Rosalina was reporting on that, what happened, yeah. Rolandino, excuse me, what happened to the astrologers? Was there anything, any fallout from that? Um... Not too much documented. The only time astrologers got into trouble is when they got a little heretical, and that happened very rarely. Uh, there's only one clearly documented instance of it, uh, Cecco Doscoli, who was burned at the stake uh, for reasons that are not entirely clear. Uh, but he, he, he did dabble a bit in the black stuff, apparently. Uh, but uh, Thorndike is of the opinion that his main problem was he pissed off a number of really important churchmen. <laughs> That, that would make sense that get mm -hmm. would get rather get you in trouble um. astrology was not persecuted in the middle ages as long as they followed certain rules and in my chapter three of my dissertation describes the rules quite clearly are they basically don't tread on the church's territory a uh, little more details than that don't attribute uh, don't attribute living the quality of being alive to the planets uh, give plenty of influence for free will, understand that the planets co control the body and those parts of the mind that are controlled by the body, not the free will, and don't do magic. 
I remember hearing there was also someone who decided to try cast the chart for Christ and got himself burned at the stake, too. Uh, burned at the stake, no. Well, that oh. may have been one of Chuck Odaskali's problems, actually. Oh, uh, okay. That, Maybe that was the um, same person. Yeah. Uh, Cardano got chastised for it. Um, Bacon, Roger Bacon, discusses it, and it's, it is a great deal of... Bacon is not all that clearly known about. Uh, it's an argument among scholars as to whether he ever was in prison or not. Um, Thorndike believes not. Other people believe, yes, he was, and maybe even twice. But um, it was considered uh, borderline heresy to say that Christ was in any way subject to astrological forces. Okay. A um, couple more questions here. One back on talismans, wondering mm -hmm. if they needed to be forged in the type of metal ruled by the planet the moon happens to be aspecting. Was that the rules they uh, use? I, mean, I don't know if it was that simple, but the material of talismans was very specifically laid out. And I, if I recall, the Pickwick does wants relate. Information, yeah, anybody who wants information on this should go to renaissanceastrology.com, uh, uh, Warnick's um, uh, web page. He, that's what he's peddling, is the knowledge on talisman making and so forth. Yeah, Warnick. and he's specifically using the Picatrix for that, so that would be... Pretty much, yes. Yeah. Okay, another one based on elections for war and battle, and mm -hmm. since you would activate your electional chart by starting out, would did you have you found that there are you know where they've got odd times where they begin their battles or they begin their their campaigns or even a war by ambush because they're trying to get the jump on the, having the right chart. Well, we know for sure that there were a number of battles that were elected. I mean, this is not a matter, we don't have to look look for indications of it. They were overtly elected. Oh, okay. Um, Charles V of France had uh, battles elected. Uh, Bonatti's patrons had battles elected. It was, uh, Henry, uh, excuse me, Frederick II had battles elected. It was not an uncommon practice. Uh, I would also say it was not routine, but it was not uncommon. Okay. Well, another question is: By any chance, do you have the date of his of Ezzelino's actual death? No, because uh, what they basically you know what an oubliette is. Mm, I. It's it, it's a place of forgetfulness. Okay. What if you really wanted to get rid of somebody, but you didn't want to kill him, you just put filed him away in a part of the dungeon and sort of forgot that he was there. Ah. That's probably what happened. So nobody knows when he died. He probably died of starvation and thirst, or possibly of infection, because his foot was probably not treated. Mm -hmm. He was hated, and so he was not shown a lot of mercy. That would be a good reason for the astrologers to do, especially if, as you say, his way of getting their cooperation was by threatening to kill people they cared about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Let's see if I've got any... Um, I th think I've caught most of these. What you have to understand is astrology was basically uh, performed functions that was analogous to modern intelligence. Uh, you could find out things the enemy were doing by horrors, and, and of course picking times for doing battle was more strategic than intelligence. But uh, um, now I would say, for example, the problem that really tyrannical rulers like, uh, what's his name there in uh, Kenya, not Kenya, um, oh hell, I can't remember what, the country just to the south of Kenya, um, and other African rulers like that who might have used it conceivably, or for that matter, a more well-known incident uh, was um, late of Iraq, um, Saddam Hussein, uh, was well-known in the Arab world to use astrologers. Um, in fact, there was one who, uh, there was a great joke about his astrologers when the first Gulf War um, tore through him like a knife through hot butter. Um, but what nobody seemed to notice is that he survived. <laughs> um, but the point is this, um, if you have intelligence people, you've got to listen to what they tell you. You can't execute them for giving you bad news. <laughs> And it goes with astrology is the same way. You can't you can't harass the astrologer because the astrologer gives you bad news. What you do is you uh, punt, and regroup, and try again. Uh, so, Ezzelino's strategy with the astrologers was 
absolutely self-destructive. Well, it does sound like he fulfilled his mother's prophecy, but not quite in the way. Oh, he did. He <laughs> conquered all the places they said he, she said he would conquer, and then he fell. Yeah. <laughs> she just left out one little detail. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that, that last, w would decide the matter. Was that where the battle was actually, that, where she said in her prophecy? No, but he did conquer the, ca the castle in question. Oh, okay. Uh, another one last question here. Uh, did they mm -hmm. use cipher based on astrology? Did they actually incorporate, do you know if they did any kind of, you know, when they're trying to, I'm, well, I guess. I'm not even sure what question's asked. Oh, using ciphers. And code, you know, you mean? codes, yes, yeah. based on okay. astrology. Oh, um,. Not typically to obscure military intelligence, um, but as a uh, book on uh, Lily points out, or academic book, uh, I think Anne Geneva is the name of the author. Um, in the almanacs they wrote in code, when they said the sun was in big trouble, that meant the king. Uh huh. Yeah, they would do things like that, but it was quite transparent, but it gave them deniability. <laughs> Any, 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 what, what I found rather naive about the book is the Strucker is surprising. <laughs> it seemed to me, oh, what else is new? You know, this is, this is a Pope Catholic. You know, <laughs> yeah. that you don't come out and put out your almanac for the country and say, oh yeah, the king's in trouble this year. <laughs> yeah. Not if you want to keep your job. Did they, in terms of techniques, was the antecedent use during this yes. period? Uh, quite extensively, although not universally. All the textbooks describe the Anticia.